Welcome everyone, we'll get started very soon. All right, looks like the room's filled up enough, so we'll get started. I'd like to thank VizTech for sponsoring this webinar. We're going to have some, some of their reps in the chat to answer any questions that you guys may have. If you have any questions for Renee, please input them into the Zoom Q&A, and we'll get to as many of them as possible. And uh, without any further ado, Renee, please take it over. <laughs> Quickest intro ever. <laughs> Yeah, we got a lot to cover. Got to be we efficient. have a lot to cover. Yeah, we're gonna gonna do our best here to get get through it in the next like ninety ish minutes. Uh, but yeah, so ah, wrong button. There we go. Perfect. The first mistake of the day. We're good. <laughs> um, okay, so storytelling with pixels. Uh, thanks so much, Ms. Tech and Wacom, for having me part of this event. This is uh, I'm super stoked about it. <laughs> Uh, so this is an adventure into hard drives. Uh, so this is some of my favorite storytelling images over the years. Uh, how we made them, what I love about them, and even when they're not perfect. Um, and then on top of that, it's going to be a bunch of tips and tricks to improve your own storytelling. Uh, so who is Renee and why should you care? Well, you don't have to care. <laughs> uh, I'm just a photographer and a pixel make, pixel crusher, photoshopper human from Canada. Um, and I've spent the last 12 years of my career running around the globe, except for the last one. <laughs> Uh, running around the globe, you know, making fantastical, weird artwork for, for clients and for myself. Uh, if you're curious to see more of my work, you can go to my website, renerobin.com. Uh, I started in Photoshop in 1998, although it might have started in 1997, but it was a long time ago. And eh. But anyways, so I've been using Photoshop for a long time. Uh, I started in photography in 2007. I'm a terrible illustrator. <laughs> I have way too many ideas. Real life is super boring. So that's why I choose to do compositing. And that's mostly the majority of the work that I do. So I make stuff like this and like this and stuff like this with horses and amazing talented people. And a lot of it is digital art like this. So we start in the studio and then pull it all together. However, today's work, today's lecture is not all about compositing. Um, I've given a lot of those over the years and this time we wanted to focus more so on the storytelling aspect of it. So a little bit like a step back from like, you know, the fine details of like, this is how you do super crazy gnarly masks. Um, we've covered, that's co been covered a lot. So let's, um, let's try to like stretch this out a little bit into a new form. So what makes a good storytelling image to me? So in this case here, we're gonna go through images that are composites. Some of them are like documentary style. Some of them are basically like all across the board, all the stuff that I shoot. And a lot of the stuff that normally I don't really talk about very much because it's not compositing. Uh, but the storytelling aspect is what's interesting to me and what is it going to be the basis of this lecture. So what makes a great storytelling image to me? Styling and costuming choices because styling um, is very, very important to um, your story, whether there is, you know, whether it's a fine art nude or whether you're dealing with someone who has like, you know, this this picture of Father Christmas here where there is like a ton of detail. Um, story, styling and costuming choices really play into that. Makeup and hair design as well um, can really, you know, basically push things into like what decade, what century, et cetera, and, you know, why these choices are important. Lighting, posing, props. Props are great. Props are awesome. <laughs> um, color design, and of course, the most important one is emotional connection. So notes, um, we're gonna go through these shots and talk about what I like and what I would change going forward. And yeah, like I said, there's gonna be a lot of genre hopping. So it's gonna be a little, little bit all over the place. So those of you like with the ADHD family, this is a good lecture for you. <laughs> it's gonna gonna hop around. <laughs> so 
So most importantly, projects on the cheap. So one of the biggest things in storytelling images is a lot, a lot of times people come to me and they're just like, I don't have the money to make these like really crazy gnarly images. And I'm just like, it doesn't have to be expensive. It can literally be cheap. So in this case here, I'm going to go through the next three images that were created that are some of my favorite that um, uh, were made very cheap. They, they didn't cost very much money at all. Uh, some of them were free. So in this case here, uh, this is an image of um, a barbarian that we made, uh, but we <laughs> shot this in the living room. <laughs> so we went to a dollar store and we bought a sword and shield and we we're just like, what would we do with this like little kid sword and shield? And I was like, let's make the most ironic barbarian ever. Um, got some hair gel, some hair clips, some cheap hair extensions off of um, Amazon and uh, some blue lipstick. <laughs> Cause I was like, let's throw this back to, um, oh my God, what was that? The Scottish one. <laughs> Somebody in the comments call that one out. Cause you know what, you know which one it is. Braveheart, there we go. <laughs> We're like, let's make this a shout out to Braveheart. So his outfit, um, the, the kilt that he's wearing is a dress of mine that we just folded in half and held. So like, there's no back. <laughs> we just folded it in half um, and tied it on with a belt. Um, the cape is just like some leftover fabric that I had. Uh, the furry thing is like this fluffy hat that I have that has like a little scarf attached to it. Actually, it has little wolf ears. It's really cute, but it didn't work for this shot. But I was like, it'll make like a shawl. Uh, and then we attached it all with a yoga strap. <laughs> So um, if you're interested in, in reading like the full like gory details of how we made this shoot, uh, you can go to my blog, uh, renerobin.com slash blog, and then you'll see the barbarian transformation. And that's what we, that's how this was made, but it was shot with one light um, and, you know, cost us very, very, very little money to make. And we came out with an image like this and, you know, we made a few others as well. But the point was that we just like challenged ourselves, like how do we make a barbarian on the cheap? Because a lot of the times we do make that, we, when we make them, they're quite expensive. And so it was just like, yeah, let's make this happen. So making images like this, it just doesn't have to be crazy, crazy, crazy expensive. Uh, this is another one here um, where basically what we did was we ran out into the forest and <laughs> picked up a bunch of sticks and brambles and tied together this with a some twine and made this gigantic broom like this is longer than the car <laughs> it's really 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 huge um and so what we wanted to do was like tell an interesting story with this but the story here i found with this image which was the one that i was the most excited about um kind of was a little bit lackluster i was just like you know this is this is fun but how do we make this more interesting um you know like the composition's okay whatever else and i was like what if we made it like he's learning how to fly and he's got like a terrible broom, like a broom that like just doesn't get along with him, right? And so we basically just like stood on the edge of these rocks and was just like jumping and jumping and like getting the most ridiculous poses that we could. And I find that as far as from a storytelling aspect, um, these are far more interesting than this. Now, again, storytelling, that's the other side of it is, is uh, it's a very personal experience. It's a very personal connection, um, you know, everyone is going to look at an image differently and see something that they like or don't like. I mean, that is the entire basis of art and the human experience in general is that we all have, we all see the world through a different set of filters of experiences. So for some people, maybe this one's more interesting, but this is my lecture and these are the ones that I find more interesting. So <laughs> um, next one here. So yeah, so this one here, it didn't cost anything. It cost the gas to basically drive out into, um, oh my God, stop. It cost the gas to drive out into um, the forest and pick up a bunch of these brambles and then just like decimated the house for a couple of days with like pieces of wood. Then this one here, this is Sir Buttercup. <laughs> this is another shoot that didn't cost a dime, uh, at least on my end anyways. And these two images in my mind tell two completely different stories. So the first one on the left um, his, this gentleman's name is Ray and I met him at an event called Land and Sea and I was like dude you have the most amazing beer like they have all these models there and they're like young and they're gorgeous and they're talented whatever else and I was like there's this dude with this beard we gotta do something with this so we like ran outside into a field and I was like oh man like I have this like gigantic big thing of black fabric because I just carry it around with me because I use it all the time um and I was like we could just like drape this on you and like you can look like some old wizard or something and he's like I have in my truck 
a chain mail piece and gloves and this sword. And I was like, what? <laughs> That's amazing. Who has that in their vehicle just like casually? And he's like, oh, I was at a truck stop and I found it for cheap. And I was like, that is so cool. Um, and so the first one we did, I was like, yeah, let's make it like a little bit more serious, but like maybe, yeah, maybe a little bit, um, and this might be a little bit young, but, uh, oh man, I'm drawing a blank again. Why is this happening? <laughs> Knee. <laughs> um, Thomas, help me out. Which show is that? What movie you mean? The yeah. What movie Knee? is it? Huh? Nights. Um, yeah. Me. It's like my favorite one too from Monty Python. It's in the chat. Monty Python and the Holy Grail. There we go. <laughs> yeah, <Wow>. that one. <laughs> God, that was hard. <laughs> Anyways, I was like, yeah, let's make this like Monty Python from the Holy Grail. Like, this will be awesome. Like, he's going to be like the, the guy and it's going to be cool. Um, and then we had this other idea of like, what if we made him like Sir Buttercup? And we, <laughs> we picked a bunch of flowers out of the field and just like put him in his beard and like gave him. So the one pose he like has kind of like a stronger pose, you know, um, he could be the one that's saying like, you chose wisely, right? Um, you know, in, in the, um, the Raiders of the Lost Ark or the next one, he's like holding his sword a little bit closer to him. He's like, his eyes are a little bit happier. He's a little bit more chipper. And then with the flowers everywhere, it's like, he's the guardian of nature, right? And so it, these two images taken just like a few minutes apart, I love them both so much, um, you know, and, you know, just because, I think they're just, they both tell interesting stories. Um, and yeah, and so just for, for the tech gears in, in here, I'm sure there's some, uh, this was lit with a, with a strobe off to one side um, that does like kind of fill in some of the shadows a little bit, so. This one is another one of my favorites. So a friend of mine is a music performer. Um, he runs a group called Ivarden Sphere and it's like this heavy, like industrial thumpy, like big drums and heavy percussion and stuff. And he's like, I need some more photos that like, you know, suit my brand of music. And I was like looking at him and I was thinking about it. And I was like, what can we do that's gonna, that's gonna work? And also we were on a time constraint. So this just like had to be made like right away. And I was like, uh oh, well, what if we made you a frost giant? And I was like, you're big and bald and you're not actually scary, but we can make you look scary. <laughs> um, so we went into my basement, which was a huge mistake. <laughs> If you're ever going to shoot with flour, do it in the garage. Uh, we did this in my basement and flour took like two years to get it all out. It was awful. But this was just like a bag of flour and we just like covered them in it. And then um, I just have like one beauty dish off to the side. So it's a single light again. And we had him just like jump. So we covered him in flour and then just like hop a little bit. And then um, my sister was behind him just like throwing flour and hitting him in the back of the head. So it like wrapped around. So that's what you're seeing with this like little wrap around of flower like around his face and i was like this <laughs> you look like a totally awesome like frost giant and i love this story um like one of the biggest things that i like about storytelling and images is that i never want to tell the full story so some people when they create images they want to tell the entire story of an experience that they've either experienced or witnessed or you know they've created one in their mind um, my interest is i like to create just enough of a story to get people going and to get them excited <laughs> you know i want people to look at this and be like oh my god when i was a kid and i was like playing magic at the gathering there was this one card and like this totally reminds me of that those are the things that i think are really really interesting um and so i'm very grateful that i have clients and friends who are willing to experiment on some of these things with me hey renee yeah i've got a question about this photo can 100%. you speak can you speak to the decision on color toning for this yeah, so uh, color toning for this one was literally just, I wanted it to feel cold, really wanted it to feel cold, um, but I didn't want it to be just like a monochromatic image. So I added just like a tiny little bit of uh, red. I think we added some red makeup to his eyes and then I enhanced it a little bit in post-production. Um, but yeah, and then I, I wanted it also like a little bit desaturated. I didn't want it to be like, I wanted it to feel bleak. I guess. And so that's why we went with this. So it's like, if you walked into a cave and you saw this and it was 20 feet tall, um, you know, and it's a cannibal or something, I don't know, <laughs> uh, that like you feel doom <laughs> that you just feel like, oh my God, there is no getting out of this. And that's kind of why I chose the color grading I did. Um, this, this image actually is printed um, in my living room. <laughs> I have a 16 by 24 of it because I love it so much. <laughs> Um, let me know if that answers the question, Thomas, or if we should. That did. That was perfect. 
cat cool beans next find people with interesting hobbies and this is like another one of the cheaper options um finding people with interesting hobbies because they're already doing cool stuff right so they're all do already doing interesting things whether they're like a metal worker or in this case here um a woman and her and her horse um like people who ride motorbikes people who do martial arts people who play the piano artists illustrators all of these people who do interesting stuff um have interesting stories to tell visually and so in this case here with Kristen, uh, this is the story of her and her bond with her horse at um, it's, you know, it's getting closer to the end of his life. And so we wanted to capture like that bond between the two of them. And so we spent the day and basically shot these like documentary style. And there's some of my favorite images because Ice is such a gentle, beautiful soul. And so is Kristen. They're, they're perfectly matched the two of them together. Um, and we actually have, um, we've created like a bunch of artwork before that was like heavily stylized and everything. And I was like, man, let's just do this. Like just the two of you. Uh, and so these are three of my favorite images, even though we shot, I think there there's like 40 final images in this whole set that I love, but I love these, like, you know, they show the personality and the trust and just like the casualness of the two of them together, you know, just like walking down the road in the rain, everything's fine. Um, you know, she's uh, also part of a um, medieval reenactment group. And so, and that's of course where they do most of their work together. And I was like, yeah, let's put this together. Let's like, you know, style it that way. And, you know, just show this like really great connection between these two souls, these two beautiful souls. Um, and, you know, even with the color toning, like each image I color toned differently. Some of them were black and white. Some of them had a lot of reds in the shadows and some of them I kept a little bit more saturated just because every single image just felt a little bit differently. And I wanted to be able to represent like the, you know, the years that they had been together in this series where it wasn't always just like one experience. Um, and as luck was ha would have it, uh, it was really nice out. And then it started pouring rain on us and the rain images are gorgeous. <laughs> Um, and I just really, really, really like those stories. Again, with finding interesting people, uh, the image on the left uh, is Dr. Carolyn Willekes. And Carolyn, you can slap me later if I mispronounced your last name. <laughs> um, but she is a professor at Mount Royal uh, University. And uh, she actually lectures a lot on ancient history. So she has, she's an incredible equestrian. It's insane. So she rides horses. She rides, this is her own horse. Um, and she, you know, rides horses basically all over the world. Um, and she has this amazing Roman saddle that doesn't have any stirrups and, and like, you know, the costuming and everything to go with it. And I was just like, oh my God, we have to do something with this. And so this is actually part of a, a larger shoot. So if you go onto my YouTube channel or to my blog, uh, you'll see For Love of Horses. And I think Thomas is going to put that up in the, in the uh, show notes. But uh, you can watch these videos and you can watch how everything came together. But these kinds of shots, if I was to try and style this myself, I mean, it would cost me thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. But as luck would have it, I was introduced to a mutual friend and, um, you know, she has already spent the thousands and thousands of dollars and uh, was totally down to have those stories, like, you know, the story photographed. So in this case, it's a fabricated story. It's not a real one. The previous one with Kristen and Ice is, you know, the very real connection of the two of them. And this one is more, you know, like, what would it have been like, you know, a thousand or more years ago? When did the Roman Empire fall? 2000 years ago? Yeah, 2000 years ago. Um, Carolyn's probably in the comments, just like, oh my God, get the dates right. <laughs> um, <laughs> But uh, so, you know, what would it have been like if they were riding through, you know, these, these barbarian hordes and tribes and stuff were riding through, you know, um, Southern Euro or sorry, Northern European winter. And so that's kind of what I wanted to create with this series of images. And so that's what we did. Um, and it wouldn't have happened without, you know, finding someone who has a very unique skill and a very unique collection of stuff. And I think the more we get to know people that there's a lot of really interesting people out there. <laughs> the woman on the right, her name is um, Victoria. Or, um, yeah, anyways, and uh, so she is a uh, free diver. And um, I think I just called her the wrong name too, because this is just one of those days where I can't remember anything. <laughs> this is really embarrassing. Anyways, she is a free diver, stunt driver, 
stunt performer, everything. She does all the things. She's also a mermaid and I've done a ton of work with her as well. Um, and I love working with her. She's, she's just incredible. And um, you know, when the first time I met her through a mutual friend, they were just like, oh yeah, well, we have this like friend who does like mermaid stuff. And I was like, oh sweet mermaid stuff. Like, yeah, let's go photograph mermaid stuff. Uh, and Virginia, that's it, Virginia. <laughs> sorry, Virginia, I'm so sorry. Um, Anyways, so yeah, so uh, when I found out she did mermaid stuff, I was like, this is gonna be awesome, let's do all this stuff. Uh, but then I also found out that she's also a stunt rider and so she has her own horse and she also does all this other stuff and she you know, does work with Disney and she's like a princess and all this stuff. And I was like, this is so cool to have somebody who has these amazing set of skills who is also interested um, in collaborating and telling like interesting stories. So in this case here, the story for me was more of like this like water goddess thing um, and we had this amazing gown from Firefly Path that I was just like, this, it's just magic. <laughs> you know, you don't have to work very hard when someone with that level of skill, especially posing underwater, um, you know, you just basically sit down there and you're just like the dummy hitting the button. <laughs> um, but these are another two other images that I made with Carolyn and with Virginia. Uh, of course, this is the mermaid shoot that we did. This is the first shoot that we worked together. Uh, and I just, I was so inspired by watching her move around in the water. Like she's just like, it's so, you can tell it's her natural element. She spends a lot of time down there. And then this is Carolyn again on the right-hand side, even though we mixed timelines here, like these, these two timelines between the, um, the front rider and the back two, they never really crossed us historically, but I was like, let's just do it. <laughs> Cause I think it'd be fun. Um, and it was, and it's like one of my favorite images where I was just like, you know, people mash up music and I was like, well, let's just mash up, mash up some history and it'll be fine. <laughs> but Everything. again, these are people with their own horses, with their own kit. They're all performers. They're stunt riders. They put on shows and everything. And so they're very capable people and they just have a very interesting interest. And so therefore there's so many stories that can be told there. Can you speak quickly about the, the complexity and what's involved with doing underwater photography? Oh yeah, it's real hard. <laughs> yeah, I bet. Yeah, um, so shooting underwater uh, is not for the faint of heart, uh, especially uh, for from the modeling side. So from the photography side, um, you need a housing, obviously, uh, depending how deep you're going. And uh, you gotta be able to hold your breath. Uh, you can do it with, uh, with breathing tubes, and, um, you know, bottles and whatever else, but uh, I, I just free dive it because I figure if my model doesn't have anything to breathe with and we're just in a swimming pool, like I don't do any open ocean stuff. So I'm not like Brett Stanley and like, you know, all these amazing other underwater photographers in the world. Um, I am safe in a pool because <laughs> I'm born and raised in Canada and I'm not, not big on the ocean thing. But 99.9% um, .9 of your shots underwater are gonna be garbage. Um, you're gonna miss focus on something um your exposure is going to be weird the pose will be just not quite right and there's no way to like perfectly fine tune something underwater because you're just like okay let's go through this sequence of motions let's do this sequence of of you know like oh like let's try that back bend again and you're like oh i didn't quite get it quite right this time let's try it again change the an camera angle etc um shooting underwater is definitely one of the most challenging things i've ever done in my entire life <laughs> um never mind the fact that you know you're just like sitting on the bottom of the pool, holding your breath, like keeping your heart calm and then trying to capture what's happening in front of you effectively, all the while dealing with the fact that even in the cleanest of pools, inevitably, as soon as you put a person in there, there's gonna be debris, there's gonna be like hair or like parts of the costume and everything else that can totally blow your focus or even your composition. And shooting with, um, you shoot with a underwater housing and it's like, it's big and it's heavy and you can't, you're wearing a mask, you can't quite see through it. Um, and even live view, it's, it's not the same. I mean, underwater photography takes a lot of work in post-production to get it back, like to get back all the colors, because as soon as you drop down to a certain level underwater, you lose all your red and orange tones. So everything just kind of goes like blue and green. Um, so it's a lot of work in post to rescue, I guess, <laughs> that information and bring it back. Um, does that kind of help answer it? It's perfect. Cool. Um, the other thing that I will let you know is that I didn't, what I didn't know is working with horses uh, and I'm sure shooting underwater now that I think about it requires stunting insurance. So if you have insurance, uh, photography insurance for your plan, um, definitely call before you start working with big animals or underwater, um, call your insurance company and be like, hey, so am I covered for this? <clears throat> and if, uh, 
uh, if you're not, then uh, make sure that you have all your all your stuff crossed. <laughs> so younger me didn't know about that until this horse shoot. And then I was just like, oh my God, stunting insurance is crazy expensive, but it's the only thing that works when you're dealing with large animals. Anyways, <clears throat> one second here, I need some tea. <laughs> Uh, next up here is um, <clears throat> musicians. Musicians are amazing. I love photographing musicians because they always have so much personality and it doesn't matter what kind of musician. So in this case here, uh, Anita Strauss, she plays guitar. Uh, she works with Alice Cooper and she's super, super, super talented and she's got her own solo album. <clears throat> Pardon me guys. Um, anyway, so she flew out to Newfoundland to shoot her album artwork and I was like, super cool like real excited about it um so in this case here the story that i wanted to tell was like the story of her um you know like just like her as the person like this is the badass playing the music that you're listening to but the next image i actually made after the album was released because i'd, I'd heard the album and i'd listened to it and i was like what does it feel like listening to this album and so in this case here i took these like massive waves so we took this image of her shot on location um, in Newfoundland on like these huge cliffs and uh, and I was like you know it's kind of like she just like controls these oceans of sound of like super powerful music and so I was just like yeah let's like how do I tell that story visually and um, I have these incredible wave photos from shooting the Titans of Mavericks uh, down in uh, San Francisco and Half Moon Bay from a few years ago and I was like oh my god that's exactly it that's perfect it's just like her there with the guitar on this cliff edge, right? And just like these huge waves of, you know, you know, water and sound coming in around behind her. Like she's like in control of it. And um, yeah, man, musicians, I can't speak enough to them. And musicians always need promo. So if, you, <laughs> if, you're, uh, if you're feeling really, really stuck creatively, um, start looking around and just seeing if you can find any musicians that um, either need work or just like you would like to photograph because they have so much personality, especially like with the ones who perform on stage. There's just like, they know how to look awesome and it really does make your life a little bit easier. This is a personal favorite of mine. I love this shot. <laughs> um, so we were doing a completely different shoot. So we had like a video crew on this day. Um, there was pre-COVID. <laughs> there was a lot of, um, there was just a lot of people on set that day and uh, we were shooting like cowboy themed stuff. And at the end of the shoot, we were just like, man, let's like put all the crew in the costuming and like get these portraits of them just because like, why not? <laughs> and everyone was down. Everyone was like, yeah, of course I'll totally do that. And this is actually one of my favorite images from that day, just because I love the story of like, you know, this introspective moment of him, you know, holding the rifle and just the way his hands are touching the firearm. It's just like this very, you know, like that's his best friend in the entire world, right? Like there's no one else in this world but him. Um, I thought about compositing it. I've worked on trying to put in some backgrounds into it, but it always looks weird. I always just come back to like this clean edit. And I think it just like, it just tells like that's the story is where his hands are. And just like, you know, the slight looking down of his expression. Um, I absolutely love it. The one thing that I would do when I left it in this image for this lecture is uh, his watch is on. <laughs> so you always have to be mindful whenever, especially if you're creating historical uh, imagery, is to make sure that there's no modern technology that wouldn't have been there in the first place. So one of the one of the ones, of course, obviously a watch doesn't make sense, um, at least not <laughs> not one made like that. Uh, but another one to watch out for is zippers. Uh, so zippers and historical images uh, don't really match very well. <laughs> So let's see here. Uh, oh, I see a question pop up there, Thomas. Yeah. You know, so when you look for models or do you, do you pay your models or they work for free? Do you give them copy of the photos? How does that all work? Yeah. So I try to do a little bit of all of that. It really depends on the job. Um, so sometimes we'll do, so if there's no client involved and it's literally just like hanging out and creating pixels, then, you know, we often will do a trade for time. Uh, but I do love being able to get money in people's hands. So one of the ways that I'll do it is if we do a trade shoot, but then if I start, if I say like, hey, are you okay if I sell prints of this? So whenever I sell a print, I give the model who's in that image a, a portion of the sale. Um, so I find that's a way to like 
keep it honest between, you know, um, the person who's giving their time and, you know, vice versa. Um, so yeah, sometimes uh, definitely like if someone has like a really amazing look, that's exactly what I'm looking for. And it's for a project, like especially if it's for a client or something, 100% everyone's getting paid. <laughs> Um, yeah, I've never been shy about paying people and, um, but it is, uh, I mean, if there are ways that we can find like mutual agreements. So the other agreement that I'll make sometimes is, uh, let's say the person has a popular OnlyFans page, or, um, if they like to sell prints of the image themselves, then I'll just say like, yeah, for sure. Like, let's just agree on a price and then you can sell copies of this print. Here's a print file. And then I'll sell copies as well. So there's a lot of ways to make that work so that it feels like it's beneficial to everyone because uh, I the last thing I want is anyone in these images to feel like they've been um, exploited or taken advantage of. Cool. Um, and then Steven wants to know, would you burn down the strap on his right shoulder? Yeah, so I did already. <laughs> um, I probably could bring it down a little bit more. It is it is like a little, little bit bright, but um, yeah, this this image has never gone for print. So I've never really like plowed through it. Uh, with the fine tooth comb that I normally would um, if it was going for a print file. So right now, this is just an image that lives on my website that I just kind of, I love. <laughs> so, but yeah, that's a super good eye. <laughs> cool. Okay, cosplayers on the topic of cosplayers. Cosplayers are awesome. They're super talented. Um, and I do try to work with, uh, you know, I don't work with like tons of cosplayers, but I do like working with them. Because it, so first of all, it's, um, and LARPers, of course, um, it's, it's super diverse um, and it's filled with people who are like really, really talented. A lot of the, these people are making their own costumes. So they're inherently super creative. Um, really great cosplayers then it's like, don't be on the topic of money. Don't be afraid to pay the rates, right? Like there these costumes cost them, you know, sometimes thousands of dollars to make. Um, and so, you know, if they're okay with the trade, if they're just like, yeah, we just love these new photos and they can go on like my fan pages and stuff. And you're just like, sweet. Yeah. Trade straight across the board. Awesome. Um, but if you're coming up, um, you know, and you're trying to expand your portfolio and you're trying to, um, you know, push your work to the next level, don't be afraid to ask people like what their rates are and if they're comfortable with that. So, you know, it, it doesn't take much to make someone feel appreciated for the efforts that they're putting in. Um, and my favorite thing about cosplayers is that they, they're, because they're so creative, they have so many ideas for the photographs themselves, right? So they, like, they want to look awesome in these shots and they, they know the backstories of the characters and they can just like, they really can, um, they, I mean, they even act into these scenes, right? And that uh, is like a step further than, you know, um, what a lot of typical models can offer, right? Because it's, this is different from fashion, right? This is telling like a story <laughs> um, and typically a story that has something to do with a show or whatever. So this is like in homage to someone else's work. Um, you know, there is like a little bit of sketch, just like sketchiness around selling cosplay images, but that's another conversation. <laughs> that's uh, somebody, <clears throat> somebody else can touch on that one. But I'll quickly go through these four images here, what I love about them. So the image on the left is Vivid Vision and she's this incredible cosplayer and I've been wanting to work with her for a long time. And the worst part is we even live in the same city. <laughs> um, and I was just like, I, I wanna work with you but I don't want to photograph any of the necessarily like the cosplay outfits that you have. Like, do you have anything that's like historical or cultural or something um, to you? And she's like, well, I have these beautiful white and, and also a red hanfu. And I was like, oh my God, yes, that would be amazing. So she brought this, this incredible wig and this, this, you know, outfit and it's this light chiffon material and you could just like watch it floating in the air. You know, we just put on like a fan and then just like let her move. And um, one of my favorite little details of it is I love the little stray hairs growing across the face. Now I know a lot of photographers like to edit out hair growing across the face, but I love, 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 love really delicate pieces of hair cut, like just going across the face. I think it just adds like a really nice, um, a nice little piece of movement to the shot. Sorry, the power just flickered here. <laughs> so we're still good, I think. <laughs> yep, so far so good. Okay, weird. <laughs> like all the lights in the house just went wee. <laughs> um, <laughs> anyway, so the next one over is Isabel. Uh, so this time the idea for the costuming came from from me so her and i had done some work together last year actually for another wacom event 
and she showed up with these like amazing elf ears and I was like oh, a little elf girl this is so exciting and she's like she's perfectly built for it she's like the genetic <clears throat> you know match for that look and so I was just like oh my god like have you ever played shadow run and she's like well a little bit and I was like we should make a shadow run elf like let's make a punk rock elf um and so that's what we did I was like let's like modernize it and so she brought some of her clothes and then we had a friend of ours like another designer bring in some accessories and stuff like that and I was like let's just like tell this like really cool character <clears throat> and just enough of a story that it just gets people inspired to fill in the rest of the story themselves um so yeah so those are like that's one of my favorite images that I've taken recently I actually did that just a couple weeks ago Image on the right of that um, is Jeremy, and uh, he is the Ice Warrior. Uh, his this image has been around for a long time, but I just I love the details in the shot. I mean, his armor is incredible. Um, I love his expression. I like the winter and everything. It just looks like hard. <laughs> you know, it just looks uncomfortable, and that's really what I was going for with this shot. And again, you know, everyone else is going to look at this and see something different, but. Um, you know, it's just, I love these quiet moments in between when it comes to creating these shots. And he had so much great feedback when we were working together of like, you know, cause I, I made a bunch of other images for him and he's also an incredible VFX artist. So uh, he is 10 times, a hundred times the compositor that I am. Like he works in like feature films. <laughs> um, and so he had this like this great feedback for me on like how to improve the, the other images that we had worked on together. Um, and that's like, I'm very, very, very grateful for that. And the last one is Carly that I, I love this. It's just a snapshot. It wasn't even like an image that we were shooting for like, you know, for the series. Um, but I just think it's so cute. Like the story there is just like, you know, like, yeah, this is the modern world that we live in. You know, like it's cool now if you go out dressed up in some armor, you know, like a character from The Witcher and, you know, people don't really look at you weird like they would have um, 20 years ago. <laughs> Could you imagine doing this even in the 90s? Uh, you know, people would be, it's, it's just a totally different culture now. And I love that. And I love that, you know, that this image kind of basically makes that story in one shot that there's just this girl and this is her outfit, but yet then here's this like modern piece of technology um, documenting what she's doing, right? Which is the essence of social media. Um, so yeah, it's just like, just like a fun little story for me, even though there's other images from that whole shoot that I, that I love, but I think this one's just like, it's very cute and it's a personal favorite of mine. This one is another favorite. And <laughs> this is, um, <clears throat> these are some LARPers again uh, with from the same group with the horse people. And uh, we're at the end of the shoot and everyone's tired and everyone's cold, it was winter. And they basically came up to me and this is why I like working with people who have like interesting talents, right? Because they're gonna come to me with ideas that I am not willing to ask people to do. So these guys normally they do full, con full contact combat. Um, and I'm never gonna ask someone to take those shots. I'm never gonna be like, hey, do you just wanna like bash the crap out of each other for an image? I'm not gonna ask that question. Uh, maybe that holds me back, <laughs> but uh, I'm, I'm not that person. But so Bonnie came to me and she's just like, hey, like we have a little bit of energy left and it's cold, we can warm up. Do you wanna just like shoot like the two of us? And I was like, that actually sounds amazing. So he popped off two smoke bombs and just let these two go at each other. <laughs> Um, and I would have loved to have been able to shoot this with a wide angle lens to like really get like, you know, like what it feels like to be in there. But also I didn't want to get hit. <laughs> I didn't want my camera or me to get hit <laughs> by like a shield or something, um, you know, and especially it was my first time seeing like, what does this look like between these two people uh, if they start like swinging at each other? Um, so sometimes when it comes to telling great stories, you have to watch what's happening in front of you a few times to figure out like, okay, this is the best way to tell the story. Um, but unfortunately it was like minus 25 Celsius out that day and everyone was cold and we were just like, we'll shoot this really fast. <laughs> we have like two smoke bombs left and then we'll just call it good. So this is a, a story that I do plan on coming back to at some point, um, you know, now that I've seen like how they behave and what that actually looks like. Use color to help tell your story. How are we doing on time here? We're doing, doing good. Okay. I had a I had a question for you. Oh yeah, for sure. Uh, what's what's your setup? What do you usually take to photography shoots? And also, most importantly, what tablet do you use? Mm, okay. <laughs> uh, I have a Canon 5D Mark III and a Sigma 70 to 200 uh, that I love 
the crap out of. It's great. Um, I also have a Canon 24 to 105 and a 16 to 35. Uh, I do have a uh, Canon 135L that I love, but it's, um, especially for shooting stuff that's like impact like this, um, a, a zoom lens is just far more practical. And as far as tablets go, I have an Intuos Pro and I have the Wacom one, like the little screen that you can draw on, the lighter version. Um, I wanted one that I could travel with because before 2020, I was traveling a bunch um, and I wanted something that I could draw on the screen with because I find that, especially for detailed masking, it's just a more pleasant experience. I can kind of just like relax into it a little bit more. Um, but yeah, that's my, that's my stuff. <laughs> cool. Most of my stuff, except for my tablets is, is used. Like people are always like, well, how do you afford to buy it? I'm like, man, just go to your local camera store and be like, do you have this lens? Do you have this lens? Do you have this lens? I just, yeah, I buy like almost everything secondhand except for the 70 to 200 that was brand new. That's some good advice. Yeah. <laughs> All the pro gear stuff, man, like it'll take a beating. So like, why not buy it used? So use color to help tell your story. So this is an image of Lana and she want, she's like tall and strong and like a total badass. <laughs> she's really awesome. And we really wanted to like tell that story, but with like a little bit of a modern twist, hence like the nails and the lipstick and the lashes and stuff like that. But in this case, the color I wanted to use is that I wanted this to be like, this is like a powerful, hot-blooded woman. This is like a lot of personality. This is like a leader. And so what I did was I, I just put um, orange and red gels behind her and then um, just like a light, like a very gentle uh, blue gel on the beauty dish in front of her. And that created this like really, really nice color balance in the shot. And then when I switched over the background to just like a sunset image, um, it really kind of like tied, pulled all this together. So um, this is actually, I, I don't normally work with gels a lot. So this was actually one of my favorites that had come out recently. Uh, this is the importance of color. So these images were taken just a few minutes apart, um, you know, in a very similar location. And the first image on the left, this is a Maria Amanda. We photographed this in uh, Copenhagen, actually in Denmark. And she's this beautiful elf creature. And the first dress was like soft and pretty and light and airy. And we went into this like gigantic atrium, this garden. And there's just like this really pretty light coming and her pose is very like gentle and happy and kind of like, you know, forest elfy. Um, but then we changed her outfit into something that was a little bit more restrictive. So she has this corset on um, by Black Royal Black Couture. And we went into some shade and her expression, you know, changed to something that was a little bit more serious, a little bit more somber. And so even though these images were just taken a few, just like just a few minutes apart, I felt that the image on the right was like a little bit it needed a cooler color treatment than the one on the left. The one on the left feels like happy and light and free. And I felt like if I put a happy light color toning on the image on the right with a corset, it just, it didn't feel right. It just like looking at it, it felt like there was this disconnect between like what the pose was saying and what the color was saying. Um, so definitely like keep that in mind when you're working on these files. Uh, this is Richard, I love this photo of Richard. Uh, this is a photographer in the Netherlands and we photographed this here in Alberta. And uh, the color in this one, so color for me uh, has never come easy. Uh, color for me has been like aggressive study and practice and a lot of failure and a lot of like really poorly colored images. Um, but in this case, yeah, like this image was shot in the studio um, and I hand painted in all of these colors. And so in this case, I wanted the, I wanted this feeling of, of power, right? And that's a very common thing in the images that I create is I want people to feel strong. I want them to feel like, you know, like they're this force of nature. And so I did that here with this photo of Richard. And, um, you know, so like the red kind of personifies that maybe this guy isn't like a super nice guy. Maybe he's like this like kind of evil necromancer or something, right? Cause he's like in a church and maybe he's gonna raise the dead. <laughs> Right, maybe that's just what's gonna happen, right? And it's, you know, this like stereotypical, it's like the warm and cool background. Uh, I realize it's been done to death, but I also just really like it. My lizard brain gets really excited about this color palette. And so I work with it a lot. But in this case, this, this color palette kind of has like a little bit more of like aggressive feeling. But in this case here, this is very similar color palette of warm and cool that tell like a very different story, like almost like of a celebration, right? So the movement, so she has movement in her dress and her ponytail and there's these lanterns everywhere. And so while using similar colors, 
we can still tell two very different stories by you know just changing up the posing and the styling. Um, and I just saw a question pop up there, Thomas. Yeah, uh, do you usually work by yourself or do you have a crew? Do you have assistants? I usually work by myself. Sometimes I have assistants, but most of the time it's by myself. Um, especially when I start getting creative, it's just this little like tornado in my head <laughs> that like even the few times that I have had assistance, um, they just wind up helping me like load my gear in and load my gear out. <laughs> and that's about it. Cause like once I start shooting, um, the, the brain to mouth thing doesn't work very often where I'm like, oh, I need you to just move that light like three feet to the left. And instead what'll come out of my head is like, or out of my mouth, I'll be like, oh, that, that light, can you just like, I don't know, like I need it to just do this. And it's really frustrating. <laughs> so yeah, a lot of the times it. it's just myself. <laughs> It is easier with assistance, but yeah, I'm yeah, a bit well, of a Whatever trainer. works, right? Sorry? Whatever works, right? Yeah. And I mean, if I worked with assistance more often, um, then I would learn those communication skills, but <laughs> I'm slow to change. Yeah. <laughs> um, this is again, a completely different image here, but using color. So this was a very intentional shot for me. Uh, you know, this, this is the Newfoundland coastline and I love it out here. This is actually Cape Spear. So it's the furthest, most Eastern point on the entire continent. Um, and it was just like great stormy day out there and I loved it. And I was just like, you know, and it's uh, fall. So everything is getting kind of yellow. And I was like, oh man, this like this composition is so great. But we intentionally chose a bright yellow rain jacket so that he, the, you know, he would really stand out in the environment. And I was like, yeah, just like, walk down there and then just like hop back up like as if you know you would just hop down there to to take a shot and now you're on your way back and, you know and like the weather is like kind of oppressive but yet you're still very comfortable in it because the hood isn't completely covering your face like you're not trying to completely hide from the weather but at the same time like you're protecting the back of your neck a little bit um you know it's just like these little tiny moments that when it comes to building the bigger composites, shooting these kinds of shots helps make me a better composite artist. It helps me think outside the box when it comes to posing and composition. Uh, and again, this is another shot here. This is a, not a composite either. Uh, we switched out the bright yellow rain jacket and went for something more subtle because the reason why I didn't choose a bright yellow or bright orange or bright red jacket for him is in this case, I didn't want it competing with the environment, right? So in this case here, I want it to feel like you were standing there and you're looking out over this vista. So you're standing where this person is. So you can place yourself there and you can see the fog coming in to the bay, you know, into the city of St. John's and the sunset is there and it's just like, it's very calm and it's very peaceful. So, um, because like watching the fog come in through the bay in, um, in St. John's is like this amazing experience because it's like these tendrils, they just like, crawl through the city um, and everything's very quiet and that's how I really wanted this to tell that story so the the colors are quite muted um, but at the same time you know we have this beautiful gradient of like blue oh my god present <laughs> there we go no what is happening present watch this is just like we'll have to do the rest without full screen god that'd be funny um what the is powerpoint happening? doesn't like you right it's mad about it come <laughs> on <laughs> it is not a live stream or a presentation or anything until something explodes oh yeah yeah we're, we're pretty familiar <laughs> with this so no worries um do, 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 do. i mean we could just do the rest of it i guess it would suck though um but yeah anyways i'm gonna just go to the next slide and see if that's going to be better. Present. Maybe. Oh, man, you monster. Maybe this is like the spinning style. beach ball of death, but different. <laughs> <laughs> Windows. Um, yeah, we can answer some questions while I hop this forward slower than the second coming. Yeah. So. <laughs> A lot of these shots are really complicated. Do you ever storyboard the images beforehand or how do you prepare for a very complicated shot? 
Yeah, so the horse shoot uh, was storyboarded to hell. Um, that was, yeah, those were massively storyboarded. Um, so because we had so many moving parts and so many people brought into the project, uh, it had to be storyboarded. But a lot of these images here, like these are just like, I shoot some stuff in the studio. Sometimes I know what I'm going to do with it. A lot of the times I don't. I just shoot it and then I'll be sitting down at my computer one day tapping through files and being like, hey, I wonder if, and then like it'll pop out. Um, the fastest images though are the ones that I storyboard ahead of time where I have like a very clear vision of what I want. Uh, then yeah, absolutely. Like, I, just, I just sit down and it all comes out very clearly. But uh, yeah, I'm, especially when it comes to composites, I'm not always the best at pre-planning unless it's client work. With client work, obviously it has to be so. Uh, any other question? Yeah, let's go for another one. How do you decide yeah. on color grading for an image? I push sliders until I think it sucks less. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good way to go about it. Yeah, no, I don't get too complicated with it. Um, you know, I try to get better at uh, understanding color and understanding the interaction of color and how they behave together. Uh, but for me, like I said, it doesn't come easy. So I just sit there, like literally will sit there and look at it and just like, pushes back and forth and pushes back and forth and be like, ah, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. And then it'll get up, walk away, come back down and be like, well, that was a terrible idea. Push them around a little bit more, get up, walk away, come back down and be like, okay, that's starting to look better. Again, with storyboarded images or with client images, we make those decisions ahead of time. Uh, and so then we're trying to think about like, what are, what is the emotion? What is the mood that we're trying to tell in these images? And then we work with that. Um, but the rest of the time, I mean, like these, this image here, uh, was just like me bashing my head into a wall for a few years because the image on the top left is the original composite and I was never satisfied with it. Whenever I looked at it, I just felt uncomfortable, right? I was just like, this is an incomplete story because the color isn't correct on it. So the bottom image on the right, like I think it was like three or four years later, I finally learned enough about color grading and, and color theory where I was just like, okay, we can finally finish this image. <laughs> and then that's, you know, what came out of it. And I love the bottom image a lot now because of it. So when you composite an image together like this, do you use stock photos or is this everything you've taken? These are everything that I've taken. Yeah. So I do try to avoid the stock machine as much as possible. Although sometimes it is inevitable that I have to get something from stock, but these I did, I did shoot all my own stuff. So um, I find if I shoot my own stuff, uh, it matches. I can make everything match so much easier. With stock photography, I'm like guessing and like making it work and stretching it and everything else. But with me, I have I have the ways that I like to shoot, and so I photograph the stock to match that, and then it just like it just fits together really nicely. So that is the benefit of shooting your own stuff. Very cool. Also, everyone, I apologize for the slightly runny nose. I do have a cat, and I'm horribly allergic to her, and the antihistamines <laughs> have not kicked in yet. <laughs> so. Uh, don't worry about it. Um, we'll, we'll get to some of the other questions later, so continue. Okay, sounds good. Cool. Mixing strobe and natural light. Uh, so this is another thing that I love to do to tell a very interesting story. So shooting in natural light is fun, but shooting with strobe is even better. But I don't always necessarily want it to look like I brought a strobe on location. So this shot, we had a whole plan for this of like how this is going to look. And then we woke up that morning and looked outside and it was a bluebird day. And that's like my nemesis. I really hate, really hate bluebird days. And I was like, the whole reason I'm in Newfoundland is because it is constantly <laughs> foggy and constantly rainy. And the one day that we want to go out and shoot, it is so bright, <laughs> it hurts my eyes. So I was like, well, how are we going to do this? Like, you know, because I'd planned to shoot at Overcast, which is like a tiny little kick of strobe. And so we basically went into the forest and like trudged in through the snow. And uh, again, this is like another outfit on the cheap. This is just basically like a, a like a rug. <laughs> it's not even it's not real fur. Um, he has a winter coat on underneath it. And we're just like plop. <laughs> um, and, you know, I just put the strobe at a really low power because all I wanted to do was fill in the shadows because we're in we're in the shade now in the trees. It's really dark in there. Um, and I needed a little bit more light to fill. So how do I do that is by adding all the snow in the air. So he grabbed the trees and just like shook the trees to get all the snow falling and the snow diffused the light and bounced the light around so that we had like a little bit more fill light in the image. And this is kind of how this came to be. And again, it's another one of my, my favorite shots of just like this guy, he's in the forest, it's undetermined. His hair is very like, there's no, you can't really decide like what 
what time period this came from like this could be from any time period like there's no like fade there's no mohawk there's no like undercut or anything because i mean even the way that uh, you know vikings the tv show some of the hair is styled like it, it's it's a modern twist on a historical event um so in this case here like i love working with travis because um you know this style is just it can be any time and so that opens the door to a lot of stories that i can tell with him uh, this is, oh, sorry, Thomas, yeah, question? Yeah, yeah, what camera settings and flash power setting did you use for the shoot? Uh, so I probably shot this uh, with my 85, I would guess. I would have shot this at a low aperture, probably 2.8 or under, because it's obviously there's like lots and lots of really low fall off. Um, and the strobe would have been on like the lowest setting that I, that I could do with it. Um, we had these uh, like strobe box strobes out there that day. So, and it's just an umbrella. So it's, it's very, very, very simple. Then I've got a question about hair. Um, yeah. What's what the, what's the best way of compositing or cutting out hair? You do that a lot. entirely depends on how it is shot. Um, cutting out hair sucks. <laughs> uh, so I actually have like a bunch of classes on, on this. Um, one of them is using, of course, textured brushes will really help with a really great extraction. Um, if you are photographing on a contrasting background, that can help with a really easy extraction. So if you have dark hair shooting it on a lighter background, you can do a channel mask to uh, get the extraction done. Um, yeah, there's literally for as many types of hair there are in the world, there are different ways to do extractions for that. So I can't really ever say like, this is the best way, um, you know, and to go on top of that technology is getting better and better and better um you know the ai you know auto select stuff is actually starting to get pretty good and so i really look forward to the day where i can just go click and it extracts it all perfectly <laughs> but yeah things to keep in mind is shoot your hair on a contrasting background if you can uh, try to avoid green screen especially with blonde hair uh, because blonde hair is semi-transparent and then you're going to wind up having to do a bunch of color correction because blonde hair is going to look green <laughs> so uh light hair on a dark background and dark hair on a light background it will make most of your life pretty easy you said uh, you if you're trying to of... extract hair on location that just sucks <laughs> you said you had a bunch of classes on this where are those located yeah so i have classes on uh, proedu.com i have classes on creativelive.com and then i have my own a uh, website where I run tutorials as well. So I do like bundles and stuff and those are alchemistlibrary.com. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. No worries. I actually have a creative live class launching tomorrow. So, <laughs> but there's no hair cutting out in that one. <laughs> I intentionally was like, no, I'm not doing it. <laughs> I did it in other classes. <laughs> nice. um, yeah, so then again, this is mixing strobe again. Uh, this was another cold winter day. Sorry, Samantha. <laughs> uh, but in this case here, I just wanted this looks this looks more lit. So this was shot with a beauty dish outside um, with a battery pack. Um, and in this case here, the focus on the image is her eyes, right? Like that is the most important part is the, like I want the person, the viewer to look at this and go like, what's going on with this person and write their own story, their own personal narrative to this shot. Um, so back when I used to do, I used to do conventions and sell prints, every single person who bought prints of my work would all tell me a different story with the shot. And that's one of the most interesting things with, I think with creating images and storytelling is that like, we all have these filters, like I was mentioning earlier. And so everyone like writes these, their own stories in these shots. And it's just super, super, super cool what people will think of. So I really wanted, you know, we shot these like in the trees again, in the brambles. And I just wanted this to be like this kind of like tangly, like something is wrapping around her, but you don't really know what, but something maybe is preventing her from escape. Like you don't, something there, but there's tension, right? And um, the lighting, I think kind of really helped bring that out because I tried shooting this with, that, with just natural light. And she just looked like, it just didn't look right. She didn't stand out enough from the background itself. So a little bit of flash kind of helped bring that, bring her forward. Creating window light. Creating window light is a great way to tell stories, and this is very, very commonly done. Uh, usually, one strobe or uh, softbox, octabox. You can even just bounce a bare bulb light off of a white wall, um, which I do a lot as well. 
Um, it can create a dramatic or introspective experience to the person that you're photographing um, and using posing and styling to help amplify the emotion that you want to convey. So uh, in this case here, the image on the left with Amber Lynn, um, you know, we have, I love the, this pose with her. I love that it's like this contemplative thing, but I also love that we made her like not clean. Um, we, we basically took a bunch of uh, charcoal and flour and we're just like, blah, <laughs> and just kind of put it all over her and like let it get into her outfit and stuff like that. And I find that the textures, if, if those textures hadn't been there, it just looks like a boudoir image. And I'm not really interested in just photographing just boudoir. Right, so the the like the the dirt and the grime kind of changes the narrative a little bit, uh, along with that really really great pose that she has. Um, but on the opposite side, this photo with Kika, you know, she has this very conservative dress on, this beautiful headdress. Um, you know, it has like almost like kind of a cultural feel to it, and you know, with the wall that we had photographed her on, it kind of, um, you know, I want to know anyways for myself like what culture does she come from where like why is she dressed up the way that she is like is it a festival is it a wedding is it a funeral like you know and it starts making me ask questions and so the same thing is when I I want people to look at that and then start asking the same questions for themselves emulating strobe and natural light for composites this can create a more dramatic visual impact of course and it allows the subject to be a part of the like a part of the environment but also be a part just enough. Thank you, English language. Um, <laughs> so in this case here, I, I light the subject so that it looks like they are in the image, but also I'm popping a little bit of strobe on them so that it kind of almost gives a little bit of a comic booky effect. Um, this is my favorite way to create composites is that uh, I want the subject to feel a little bit surreal, right? Like, like they belong, but there's something more about this subject, something maybe a little bit supernatural. Um, so in this case here, the image on the left is uh, ironically from a creative life class that I've done where I, you know, I wanted her to feel like this, this goddess of nature, right? Um, and of course that's ampl amplified by the amazing styling. So the designer models Veritas and she just does such incredible work. And I didn't want the background to be competing with her amazing outfit, but I also didn't want it to be too like, just like clouds, cause that's boring. Um, you know, so I just wanted this like nice harmony and balance between the nature that she is allegedly protecting or at least in my mind, <laughs> um, but also that she is the dominant force. Um, the next image of course is, uh, it's kind of a more vampiric one uh, that I photographed with a woman named Steffi. And uh, you know, in this case, it's a very strong powerful image. I photographed her from a lower angle so that she really takes up a lot of space. We chose costuming that was very opulent, um, you know, and the lighting I, I wanted to amplify like how powerful she is like, um, but also that she's coming out of the darkness, right? So there's like, there's sunset behind her. So that she's really just like pushing forward and like taking control of the night. And again, everyone can look at these, you might write your own narrative and might look at that and be like, that doesn't make any sense at all. And that's fine. <laughs> that's, that's how this stuff works so but, in in general in general what types of clients commission you to create custom work uh so pre oh no it's gonna start glitching again uh -oh. um so pre 2020 um i mean i did a lot of commercial work so i worked a lot in the software and uh, technology world um on top of that um i mean people who just they want to look different. So they don't want to have boudoir photos or they're, maybe they're tired of having boudoir photos. Um, they want to look like a character out of the books that they read. So a lot of the time, even the cut, like my commercial clients that hire me, every single one of them comes to me and they're just like, we're just looking for something different. And like 99.9% .9 of the emails, that's like the tagline that I get is, you know, they're just looking for something else. And yeah, apparently I offer that for now. Cool. <laughs> so one day what I do will become dated and boring, but for now <laughs> people are willing to hire me. Well, cool, that was perfect, thank you. Okay, no worries. Big environment, little person, let the space be the story, let the human be the accessory. Gives a sense of place and room to breathe and don't be afraid to hide faces. Right, you don't, in this case here, these are like environmental portraits. So the environment is like the dominant character. Um, the person is, is literally just like, oh, there, there is a human presence here. 
Um, and some images, uh, this, this happens a lot um, with environmental portraiture for me anyways, when I take these shots is that some images resonate with your client and audience more than you. So there's a lot of images that I photograph and I was like, this is so cool. And you know, they're just like, oh, but this other one is like way stronger and I love this so much more. And I like, it doesn't, it doesn't vibe with me. Um, but, you know, I'm creating the images for them. And so the important part is that they, through their filters of life, find something that is an emotional connection for them that is the hook. So in this case here, I chose everything to be like quite monochromatic. This is actually like a really hot, sunny uh, Newfoundland day. And uh, the fog was like just rolling in. So the temperature was starting to drop a little bit. It was super windy. This is down in uh, Bonavista in Newfoundland. Um, but her dress actually was like bright, bright, bright blue. And I was like, well, I don't really want that. I want this to be like this kind of muted experience that she's like, you know, this, this afterthought in the environment. And so the only real color in there um, is the color of her hair and like some of the foliage in the ground. And so, um, you know, that's why like, that's tying in like color that's tying in posing. Like the posing is very introspective. She's kind of like holding on to herself. The colors are muted. So it's like basically everything that we've been talking about so far, pulling it in together into an environmental portrait. Um, this one here is another one where like the dominant feature are the rocks. Again, this is in Newfoundland. Um, I love photographing there. <laughs> it's just amazing. Um, but these are these like really huge, huge structures of rocks. And, um, uh, you know, basically like this person just like hopping across almost represents like, you know, the passage of time of man that like these rocks have been there, you know, long before we were and they're going to be there long after we're gone. Um, you know, and it's just like this little, like this brief moment of humanity, you know, that these rocks are experiencing, like these little tiny feet walking across their, their, you know, incredibly long lives. <laughs> um, this one here, again, is like an environmental portrait. So this one, this is composited. She, I did shoot her on location, uh, but I wasn't going to make her crawl out there in a dress. <laughs> so I just, uh, I took a dress from another image and I put it on there. But I wanted it to kind of like, you know, so we had been uh, at this location shortly after a forest fire. And you can see on the right side there, there is, you know, it was devastated. Um, it was just, it would completely burn to the ground. And so I wanted this image to almost be like, you know, this, this guardian of the forest is like mourning the death and the loss, the massive loss of life from the forest fire, right? Um, and I had intended to go back to do like the rebirth because of course, after every forest fire, the, the ground gets you know so rich with nutrients and then life begins again and I would love to go back there and um, create the antithesis of this one so instead of one being like the funeral for all the life that is lost now to create this story of you know all the rebirth and the new life that is moving into the area how are we doing on questions we're good yeah, we're good. There's a couple in there. Well, I'll ask one. So when you do color grading in Photoshop, do you use any specific plugins like LUTs or do you just use what's built into Photoshop? Uh, I do love the LUTs uh, that are built into Photoshop. Those are totally great. But I also have started building my own presets in Adobe Camera Raw and um, I kind of love it. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, I don't buy, I don't buy a lot of actions. Um, I had used the infinite color panel for a little while, but um, I mean, for, for the aesthetic of how I'm color grading these days, I just like going into, well, I start in, cap, in Capture One, then I go into Photoshop, and then I do all the compositing, and then I'll do the final color grading in Adobe Camera Raw. So okay. a, lot of, a lot of programs. <laughs> so those are the three programs you generally use? Yeah, yeah. The three programs that I, that I like almost always use is Capture One, uh, Photoshop, and uh, Adobe Camera Raw. Those are, those are my babies. Cool. Yeah. <clears throat> Okay, so for styling, I hate curling irons most of the time. I think they look, they break the subject out of the story for me, especially when I'm creating like historical-ish portraits, which are some of my favorites to make. Uh, I definitely will get models to be like, you know, or clients, they're like, hey, do you wanna, you wanna like do the shoot and stuff? And like, bring me, like, do you have any hair extensions? They're like, yeah, I'm like, bring me your rattiest ones. <laughs> Like the ones that you had for a lot of years and they're stuffed in a drawer and you haven't looked at them like so long as they match the same color ish like again i can color correct in post to like make them match a little bit easier i was like just just bring them and they're like well what should i do with my hair and i'm like don't do anything to it like sleep with it in a braid and that's it and then just like show up because for these shots like you know the important thing that i want is i want the hair to be moving right it's because the movement of the hair 
like really helps tell these stories for me um, because it keeps the image from feeling still and from feeling static, right? I love that there's like this little bit of tension and like they're within themselves enough that they're not paying attention to the hair that's going across their face. Uh, the next one of course is eyebrows, hairstyles, eyelashes, haircuts, they have dates. So use them wisely. Um, I definitely uh, try to avoid uh, fake nails when I can, or if I do just like uh, very natural looking nails. Um, eyebrows, same thing. Like I, I'm not a big fan of the Instagram eyebrow most of the time, um, you know, because they, they have a trend. And again, they're like, the, they date those shots. Um, and when I'm creating this kind of stuff, I want it to look like far, far more natural. Um, so like often it'll be like a little bit more gentle, like, like less filler than normal. Um, even, uh, like as far as eyeshadow is concerned, we really, I don't use very much and definitely no foundation, no foundation on the face whatsoever. Even if the skin is bad, um, I would rather edit, um, the skin than deal with the, like the textures and stuff like that that come from wearing too much foundation. Like if someone has natural freckle, natural freckles and stuff like that, uh, I don't want that covered up. Uh, wig hair is behaves, wigs are great, um, but I do prefer to use extensions than wigs uh, because wigs have like, wig hair behaves differently than natural hair even when uh, it is a human hair wig. Um, because so wig hair, it is weaved into the hair and it's all going the same direction, right? Whereas natural hair has like cowlicks and like, you know, it's thinner in some spots than others. And I like being able to incorporate that. So like a natural hairline for me really, really, really helps tell a beautiful story, um, you know, with, with this. Like, so I love here um, with Dane's hair, I love this little patch here where her hair is curled back. And then we have like all these little baby hairs and stuff like that. Baby hairs are so beautiful in women's portraiture and men's um, that I, I hate having to lose them. So if we ever use a wig, often we'll try to use one that's only like a half wig that it starts back here. Um, and then I'll blend those lines in post-production so that it looks a little bit more realistic. Do, do. This is another example of hair. Um, you know, I just love like, so this image of Kelly here on the left, uh, you know, we were shooting these images and she was just like, oh, what do you want me to do with my hair? Cause it, she showed up with it like curled and stuff. And I was like, can you just like dunk your head in the ocean? <laughs> that would be great. <laughs> um, and so that's what we did. And like, I love this like super texture, like in the face, like it's awesome. Um, this image here on the right with uh, Joanie, um, you know, I wanted her hair to match the dress and the dress has this like beautiful texture, you know, and it's kind of falling apart, like the elbow has been torn out and everything. I was like, can we just like get your hair to match that? So again, this is an example where hair cut, like a hair curling iron is great, but we made it like really messy so that it would, so that the texture in the image was uniform and complementary. And again, Long hair doesn't always apply to women. <laughs> um, dudes, hair in the face looks awesome. I love how it looks. Um, I, I personally really like to photograph the, the pause in between when it comes to portraits of people. I love the, the look of, you know, someone thinking within themselves and, you know, like this guy, maybe he's been the guardian of these, this castle for like time immemorable you know he's like cursed and he has to like live there and guard this place until there's nothing left but dust right and so that's kind of like what i wanted this to tell in this image uh, again another hair image here super long hair and i was like don't curl it uh, this is a composite i just had her like lay down on gray paper and i was just like yeah and we're just gonna just flop your hair around <laughs> you know i didn't um i think like so if you have natural ringlets that's different Natural ringlets are amazing. Natural curly hair is incredible. Natural textured hair, even natural straight hair is fantastic. But synthetically curled hair, unless it's done really, really, really well, um, it just screams technology to me. And so uh, I don't necessarily want that in these images. I want this to be like surreal, yes, but uh, I don't want people to be like, oh, I have that like hair tool as well. Like, eh. <laughs> but to each their own, because um, I see a lot of people doing like really great stuff with hair curlers, but it's just not for my images. Wide angle lenses for tension. Uh, wide angle lenses are awesome for building tension in a shot. <laughs> They're so good. Um, you know, in this case here, this is shot with a 24. And I had him just like lean into me and just like, you know, almost swing. 
And, uh, you know, that I think like really helps breathe like the movement in this, because in this case, he's got no hair to help tell the movement story. So a wide angle lens can really kind of like build that distortion in and help build that movement that I can't get with, you know, hair flying around. Uh, this is another example here. Uh, this is the same shoot. One of these was shot with, uh, with my 135, um, I think anyways, <laughs> might've been my 100 mil. Um, and, you know, it's like an environmental-ish portrait, but the top image, for me anyways, has a lot more tension in it. Um, you know, it really looks like, you know, you just like woke up in bed one day and there's just this creature coming over you like, oh, you have the plague, <laughs> you know, and they're like just checking to see if you're still breathing. Um, whereas the image on the bottom is more of like a, a, a story between two of these characters, right? So a wide angle lens uh, is very underrated, I find in compositing, but also can be like a little bit challenging to get it right. Um, but yeah, this is this is work with a, a Risen Armory. He's this amazing, amazing leather designer. Um, and he just like came to me and he's like, hey man, I've got these like, these plague masks, you wanna shoot them? And I was like, oh my God, this is the coolest stuff I've ever seen in my life. And we literally shot for like six hours and shot like dozens and dozens and dozens of different things just to see like, you know, what would work out. And I'm still to this day, like going through these images and editing them because I find new things that I like. Uh, yeah, so this is a full size one, but yeah, so this like really feels like it's like in your face, right? Especially if you're looking at it on like a big monitor or a big print, like this is, this takes up a lot of emotional real estate for me. Uh, this is another good example here. So the image on, on, on the left is my friend, Nathan. He's a music producer. He actually helped film uh, the horse project video. So if you ever get a chance to watch that on the YouTube channel, he's the guy who filmed the whole thing <laughs> and edited it. Um, but anyway, so on the left here, he was just like, yeah, I need like an artist portrait of like, you know, just like me as like a dude. And I was like, okay. And then he's like, and then I want one of what it feels like to be a music producer of like what it's like to be a musician, to be what, it, what it's like to like write and create sound and like put it out into the world. And so we kind of went like ridiculous, like he loves um, snowboard. And so we put a snowboarding goggles on like big snowboarding jacket because we're Canadian. And then he's like super strong saturated colors. And then I shot it with a 24 mil lens and like just like shoved my lens in his face and was like, just scream at me. <laughs> um, you know, and these have like, like, you know this is still his profile picture image, right? Like he still has like, you know, this image represents like what it feels like to create this kind of music, um, you know, and that for me is like, it's, it's really fun and complete, a complete departure again from what I normally would do. But yeah, wide angle lenses, definitely underrated. <laughs> And this brings me into my next point, which is photographing the height of action, which is super hard to do. I see a lot of people trying to do height of action shots and 99% of the time they look super cheesy, my work included. <laughs> um, it's very hard to do a convincing height of action shot. Um, it takes a lot of practice to get it right, just from a photography standpoint. And most importantly, actually the subjects that you're working with. Because if you're trying to get someone who is like peak action, whatever that looks like, um, you know, dancers aside, dancers are just like, you just hit the button and go and you can get peak action and it's gorgeous. And it's like shooting fish in a barrel. <laughs> but, um, you know, if you're trying to, oh, I just knocked my desk, nice work. Um, but so shooting height of action, it's just, it's so hard to get it right. But once you get it right, like you nail it, right? You just look at it and people are just like, whoa, this is super, super, super cool. Like the girl jumping off the building with like the little wings back at the beginning of the presentation, that's like a height of action shot. And I think one of the few that I've ever actually nailed where people who like have a fear of heights when they looked at it felt uncomfortable looking at it. And that, oh my God, we're gonna get, I don't know what's going on with my computer today. Um, we're gonna get bumped all the way back to the beginning of the presentation. So I guess, I can show you that image. We're just gonna have to scan, oh, come on, whatever. <laughs> um, just gonna scroll up there anyways. So yeah, so this image here on the left, the girl jumping off the building, that for me is a height of, uh, height of action image that actually worked out um, and you know did really well. Um, whereas so many other times that I've tried this, like it just looks lame. <laughs> like it just looks like, Someone is just like, you know, screaming like they've stubbed their toe, right? As opposed to, you know, it is like the last moment that like they're fighting for their life or something, right? It, 
it's very, very difficult. Even painters and illustrators, uh, you know, don't necessarily always do this very well. Um, but definitely if you're looking into art galleries and stuff, uh, I mean, Michelangelo and so on and so forth, that they have amazing examples of height of action that, that looks incredible. Uh, I'm just gonna keep this open like this right now because this is <laughs> ridiculous. I hope you don't mind, Thomas. <laughs> yeah, no worries, if it works, it works. Okay, so occasionally changing up, I'm just gonna check my time to make sure we're good. Yes, we're right on schedule. Um, <laughs> Occasionally changing up your shooting habits. So think outside the box you built in your own head, break your own rules. So whenever you, you've been doing something for a while, you're going to start building these rules in your head for like what you can and can't do. Like, oh, I can't do that because of X and I can't do this because of X. Like I should always take photos of women from the top down, not from the bottom up because of X, right? Like break those rules, but also break the rules on what your studio can, means, like what it means to have a studio. So these, in this case here, this images that I took here of um, Sarah, I love these shots and we photographed these in a swimming pool in Southern California and it was like hot. It was like a hundred degrees. Uh, but we just had, I had these bed sheets that we just like dipped them in the water and lift, lifted them up behind her and over top of her. And we created this like beautiful soft light because most importantly in this image, I wanted to tell the story, the story of the texture of like the headdress and the hair and this like mermaid type character that we created. Um, uh, Dinah had made these amazing headpieces and there was so much texture in this that I just, I didn't want it to be distracted by anything else except for like that little bit of water to give her a, a sense of place. Um, so yeah, so remix, remix your studios as much as you can. The power of collaborating to get inspired. Uh, obviously 2020 is not the year <laughs> to be talking about this, but hopefully we can start doing this again one day. Um, and so the power of collaborating to get inspired is, is like one of my main things. So this is, I'm very selfish when it comes to creativity in that I make sure that I'm feeding myself creatively all the time. Because if I don't look after the reason why I do this and why I love it, I burn out and I don't want to do it anymore. So uh, I'm very selfish with my time and I make sure that at least once a month I'm doing a shoot that is on my terms and something that I'm really excited about and with people who I'm super inspired by. So this image here um, uh, of the Odin character, uh, even though the patch is on the wrong eye, I think. Um, I, I, this is a photographer, Chris, Chris Toombs, and I've known him for years and he's this amazing, amazing photographer and he does great work. But also he had this gnarly beard and like, you know, and I was like, dude, let's just go like, come hang out in the studio one day and like let's just shoot a bunch of stuff. Um, the image on the right with Richard, uh, this was all shot in the same day. We had like a designer come down and we literally just like hung out all day and like threw costumes on each other and just like took photographs and like allowed that creative synergy that happens from like a bunch of really great creative people together. Like, you know, just like vibing off of each other. Like, oh, what if this and what if this? And like, you know, you try a bunch of stuff and you experiment and so on and so forth. Um, we didn't have an eye patch. So we took a lens cloth <laughs> and just like stuck it on his face. <clears throat> at first I was like, I'm going to composite it out. And then I left it in there because I was like, yeah, I kind of like that. It looks like it just happened. <laughs> um, and then with this case with Richard on the right, um, you know, again, I wanted him to look like he's like necromancer kind of thing. Cause I was like, cause he does this, like he has this really great emotive face. I mean, they both do. Um, but he has this like amazing emotive face where he just like channeled this like darkness. And I was like, Whoa, I don't know where this is coming from, but I love it. Um, but the one thing that it needed was that he needed like a hunchback. Cause like he kind of leaned a little bit, but um, you know, if I wanted this thing, this character to look like it was like raising souls from the dead or something, um, you know, I, I took, I went into liquify and I basically just like lifted his back up to kind of give him this like deformed shape a little bit. Um, and I think that really kind of like helped to tell the story of this character a lot, a lot better. And we are almost done guys. We're almost done. So we can get to questions <laughs> soon. Um, this is my last major point, uh, diversify your study. So shoot the stuff that's foreign to you. So I start, I have never started to improve as a composite artist as fast as I did when I started shooting stuff that was completely outside of my realm. So, uh, pets, for example, cats, I'm not even good at them. I don't care. That's not the point, right? The point is to be doing a bunch of stuff that, um, makes me look at what I do differently. So it changes your perspective so that you, when you go back to what you know best, you have a new way of looking at things. You have one more like, you know, skill point in your arsenal <laughs> of life. Um, allow yourself to create bad work. <clears throat> I cannot like emphasize this enough, like, uh, like create 
situations where it's okay if you just hang out and you make just bad or just average stuff. And it's fine if you share that with the world, right? Like I, I have this one image, I didn't put it in this presentation, um, where like I've always wanted to take an image of the ocean with like waves with a super long exposure. So all the waters are like really creamy and everything, right? And it's a terrible photo, it's so bad. <laughs> the, comp the composition is awful. The color grading is mediocre. Um, but I was so excited about it and I was so excited to go back and like to take those skills and apply them to composites in the future where I was like, oh man, if I photograph like these stock pieces here with the long exposure, then maybe that'll change something with this type of an idea going forward. So it just kind of added like, again, like this extra little skill point, even though the image was terrible. And I even put it, I put it up proudly online. I was like, this is my new terrible. I'm like one of the photographers who's got like a long, <laughs> long exposure picture of the like the ocean and like yay like check mark um you know maybe in like five years I'll get a good one like whatever <laughs> um same thing with photographing sports right so I started photographing climbing and surfing and like even just like the ocean itself so I try to photograph things like I have no control over because in compositing I have so much control and I want all of that control so I really push myself uh to try and put myself in situations where I have no control and the best I can do is just try to catch what I can that's going on around me, like trying to catch smoke in these moments, like learning to watch the environment to predict what's going to happen to get the shots that I need. Um, and last but not least, have fun. I mean, we don't, we hopefully do this because we like it and we enjoy it. Uh, and having fun, I think, if you're not having fun with it, well, that's a sad day. <laughs> Maybe sometimes it's okay to take a break. <laughs> Yeah, good job. Uh, Gary says your enthusiasm is contagious. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Gary. I <laughs> appreciate yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, a lot of people really, really liked this. Um, there's not a lot of questions left, but I do have one. Uh, do you have any live events scheduled yet? Or is that going to be a next year thing? Uh, live events scheduled as in? Like if you're going to do any classes? Oh, um, well, my creative live class launches tomorrow, uh, tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. Pacific. So um, yeah, that, that will be, chat. yeah, that'll be, that'll be live. And um, you can like check that out and you can watch it for free for the first 24 hours. If you like it, you can pick it up and watch it forever. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't do a ton of live stuff. I do have a Twitch channel that I'm like trying to figure out what to do with. <laughs> so yeah. Um, that's like a work in progress. <laughs> Although I finally got all the stuff. I got like, I got like the cam link thingy me jigger and whatever else. So like I'm one step closer to being Fancy. like, you know, oh my God, I have to turn the power on now. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> um, this, this question, uh, the guy meant uh, live events like WPPI or oh or yeah or... i wish i am uh, well i mean i'm up in canada so the borders are still closed oh yeah um so i don't know like i have no idea uh right now my age group is scheduled for like vaccines for like 2022 so canada's Ouch. not real doing super well on the, on the vaccination front right now um so yeah i have no idea i it's impossible to commit to anything this year yeah. um yeah, same here yeah I would love to. I would love to because I super, super miss all of that stuff. Last year was a real long year. Um, I realized that yeah. I do photography because I like meeting and working with people, not because I like sitting in front of the computer by myself for a year. <laughs> yeah, I think we're all the same on that one. Yeah, feeling it. <laughs> well, is there anything else you'd like to add? Is there any uh, bits of wisdom you'd like to share with anyone? Uh, just don't be afraid to fail, man. Make bad work. Make lots of it. The only difference between like someone who's starting out and someone who's really experienced is the mountain of crap of terrible artwork that you made <laughs> is completely different. One is way bigger. I have terabytes of drives of stuff of just awful, awful art. So relish your terrible stuff. <laughs> yeah, you <laughs> because go back of... and look at any any artist's first, first pieces. They're all garbage, but they all oh, yeah. learn from them. Yeah, exactly. Even like stuff that I do now, like I, I 100%, like I don't always post it where I, like, I'll make something and I'm just like, ugh. <laughs> That didn't work out. <laughs> just gonna delete that and <laughs> pretend it didn't exist, and we'll just try again tomorrow. Learn from it. Yeah, or I mean, you like, yeah. Sometimes you learn from it. That's the optimistic way to look at it. And then other times you're just like, <sighs> <laughs> <laughs> you just go for a walk. <laughs> yeah. Yep. So. Burn it down and go for a walk. <laughs>
hundred percent. Yeah. Every now and then you're just like, no, no, no. We're going to try this again in like four years. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, I guess that's it. Um, thank you, VizTech, for sponsoring this. Thank you, Frene. This was this was great. Yeah, really thanks for having Very me. Very inspirational. On, guys. Everyone loved it. <laughs> yeah, and if anybody has any questions, feel free to reach out to me on social media or through my website. I'm usually I try my best to answer everyone. Sometimes yeah, you're pretty active on Instagram. Track. Yeah, yeah, I try to be. Yeah, cool. and on I'm trying TikTok, but I feel like 20 years too old for it. It's very uncomfortable. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I feel that way too. Right. <laughs> But it's give it a go. You never know. Yeah, exactly. All right. Okay. Well, well, I'm going to hit the stop sharing button because that's cool. like, whoop. there we go. Nobody needs to see that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thanks again, everyone. Okay. I'll talk to you later, Renee.